Hi, this video is about John 3.14, but first I'm going to go to uh, John 3.13. And we have, and this is Jesus talking, And no one hath gone up to the heaven, except he who out of the heaven came down, the Son of Man who is in the heaven. That's a little bit hard to read. I had to look it up myself. And we have... The sentence may be paraphrased thus, No one has gone up to heaven and, and by dwelling there named a knowledge of the heavenly things. Well, one has dwelt there and is able to communicate that knowledge. That is the Son of Man, or Jesus Christ. As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So, the Son of Man, or Jesus Christ, was lifted up in the same way as Moses lifted up the serpent. It's directly there. So, why? what happened to the, to the serpent? Why was it lifted up? Why? Jesus didn't only claim to be a prophet. He claimed to be the prophet that Moses had foretold. So when he said that he is going to be raised like the bronze serpent, maybe we should figure out what that bronze serpent was. This video could be called an alternate explanation of when Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people. Why? Because I'm going to explain that the serpents may not have been serpents, may not have been actual snakes. Now you have to understand that the Israel Israelites have been wandering in the desert for about 40 years. The first generation is gone. The first horribly disobedient, the ones that rose hands against Moses, rose hands against everybody, that horribly dis disobedient generation is, is gone. So now they're, they're uh, almost, they're so far east, they're almost into Jordan, and they're going up to the promised land through the way of Atharim. And Atharim means the way of spies. Now, how did it get the name the way of spies? Obviously, it was a way, well, that's the path the spies took anyway. Well, what was the way that the Israelites were traveling? They were traveling on the way of Atharim. It's a horrible road. And I'm reading from the text here. They traveled from Mount Hor by the way to the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. They said, Why have you brought us up to out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread and there is no water, and our soul loathes this light bread. So the Israelites were grumbling, hungry for bread, tired of uh, burning <laughs> bring themselves out in the middle of the desert and what did God send them but uh, seraphs what's a seraph well it is a fiery servant no no it's a seraphim majestic being with six wings human hands what a bit more on the seraphim seraphim were literally the burning ones a poor word were winged serpents whose images decorated many of the thrones of their Egyptian pharaohs. In some cases, they wore the crowns of the Egyptian kingdoms and were thought to act as guardians over the king. Israel adopted this symbolism for God's throne. Isaiah envisioned the seraphim as agents of God who prepared him to proclaim the Lord's message to Judah. It sounds like the main object of these seraphim was to talk, to proclaim, and to message. Sounds like a agent of disinformation. So what's the simplest explanation? Was these fiery serpents, were they actual snakes? Were snakes coming into the wilderness in the middle of nowhere? Were they coming in there and biting people and uh, making all these people sick? Like a plague of snakes? Or was it because they were on the the highway of spies and people are backbiting and you have these uh, horrible people who can't stop complaining about things 
and they can't stop spreading false rumors and they know they're about to walk into the promised land and fight a huge battle they can't shut their mouths about complaining and these uh, people with forked tongues and slithering around and uh, on their belly low as a snake spreading these nastiness snake in the grass rumors and they they become fiery servants they bite people people died and people came to Moses and they said oh, we've sinned we something has to stop this and Moses prayed and he says make a fiery serpent set it on his standard it shall happen that everybody who's bitten who shall when he sees it shall live now what did that fiery serpent look like I don't know what a fiery serpent was but I'm going to bet it was something like this Snakes don't show up in the middle of the wilderness, but backbiters and complainers do. The only way to deal with all these fiery serpents is to make an example. So Moses made a fiery serpent out of bronze and he set him on a pole. And whoever who looked at the fiery serpent on the pole would live. That's the last we hear of the fiery serpent and the last of their problems in the desert. It shows up again in uh, I think it's 2nd Kings where one of the judges has to cut the, the serpent of bronze apart because people are burning incense to it. That doesn't explain why they kept it around for, for so long. It's, if it's really an idol that can heal people, why would you just continue to venerate it? I mean, it's, uh, Judaism, there's not any idol idolatry allowed. You can't keep idols around. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you... Why would Moses make... Take a brass thing make an idol out of it and put it on a pole and have people uh, look at it no no I don't think so when Jesus uh, went up to the cross was he just uh, another fiery servant was he just another backbiter a false prophet someone who was causing problems for those Israelites this is, I'm going to the Gospel of John. This is the Apostle John. He's talking about John the Baptist. John testified about him. He cried out saying, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, for he was before me. And back to the Apostle. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. What that means to me is Moses only had half of it. He had the law. He didn't have Jesus. And it makes you think about the nature of nature of God. Primshu Kabi Osho, what is God? This is the master answering the student. Osho is a mystic, very enlightened. He's not too. Osho is not very sympathetic to a Christian God. Osho answers God is not a person. That is one of the greatest misunderstandings, and has prevailed for so long that it, it has almost become a fact. Even if a lie is repeated continuously for centuries, it is bound to appear as if it is a truth. God is a presence not a person. Hence all worshipping is sheer stupidity. Prayerfulness is needed, not prayer. There is nobody to pray to. There is no possibility of any dialogue between you and God. Dialogue is possible only between two persons, and God is not a person but a presence, like beauty, like joy. God simply means godliness.
It is because of this fact that Buddha denied the existence of God. Buddha wanted to emphasize that God is a quality and experience like love. You cannot talk to love, you can live it. You need not create temples of love, you need not make statues of love, and bowing down to those statues will just be nonsense. And that's what was happening in the churches, in the temples, in the mosques. That's his answer. It's kind of an intellectual God. Osho thinks God is the greatest thing. Why can't the greatest thing have a voice? Why can't the greatest thing make a sound? Really? I mean, it's the largest thing in the universe. And you can't interact with it. I'm looking at Second Peter. It's, it's hard to I I it's hard to believe that I'm 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 reading uh, Peter. This is the guy that uh, walked with Jesus. And it's just um, I guess this is a goodbye letter. He's trying to he's saying a bunch of stuff. It's it's nothing in particular. It's not one sermon in particular. It's not like uh, Paul or anything. It's it's uh try to remember why we're believers and uh, Simon Peter says for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty for we received from God the Father honor and glory when the voice came to him from the majestic glory on the mountain this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice come out of heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We have the more sure word of prophecy, and you do well that you heed it, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of private interpretation. For no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but holy man of God spoke being moved by the Holy Spirit. This is the uh, end of Second Peter and the um, end of the video. I just want to point out that when you have the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you do react to God very differently. And if you didn't have that, you would react another way. I hope you have a nice day. Please like the video and subscribe. Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all of his letters, speaking in them of all of these things. In those, there are some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unsettled twist, as they also do to the other scriptures, to their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing these things beforehand, beware lest being carried away with the error of the wicked, you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen.